Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com. This is where entrepreneurs of six, seven, eight figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today we have David Rabbi, who's founder of Tovala. Tovala, it's, it's amazing. Tovala is a smart oven that's paired with a meal delivery service. And essentially, you have to watch the video on Tovala.com, but you get a fresh, healthy, packaged meal delivered. You scan it, you pop it in the smart oven, and it knows the precise time and method to cook to perfection. It could be broiling, baking, steaming, or convection. And I'm glad that you guys have those choices because I don't even know when I, when I turn my oven on which one I'm supposed to do. So it's good. It just does it for you. They sold 250,000 worth of Tovala ovens on Kickstarter, 100,000 of that in one day. And they won the University of Chicago New Venture Challenge in 2015. To date, they've raised over $700,000. David, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. This is really cool. And, you know, I want you to talk about developing the first. I know it's probably gone through a bunch of iterations, but talk about developing that first prototype. How many prototypes have you gone through so far today? Yeah, roughly like five or six. Okay, okay. Yeah. So developing the, talk about developing that first prototype. So the, the first one was markedly different than where we're at right now, and that's because we had a different idea. Yeah. Um, the, the core value proposition was the same, which was yeah. ship a meal, put it in, the oven yeah. knows exactly what to do. Yeah. What was but the original idea? The original idea was a machine with three separate compartments. So each compartment would function independently. It would be capable of all the same cooking methods that we have now, right. but you would put pod number one in chamber number one, pod number two in chamber number two, on and on, uh, with the idea being you know, if something takes 45 minutes to cook and something takes 10 minutes to cook, you could get them to finish at the same time. And you. the reason we had that idea initially is that was my pain point. I was using a machine that had uh, three levels of steaming but you couldn't control them independently. It was just turn on the steam and it steams equally for all three. Right. And I thought if you could separate them out, it would work great. Um, and that's the machine, we got a prototype made, we used that prototype to win the new venture challenge, mm. uh, but ultimately for a variety of reasons, decided to pivot to more of a countertop appliance. So what was some of the feedback you were getting that made you pivot? So, uh, it, it was it was as much a business decision as it was pr product feedback per se. Yeah. Um, really, we you know we'd heard from a lot of people that counter space is a huge issue, and that's obvious, right? And especially for the customers we're going after that live in cities and are really busy. Yeah. There's just not room on the countertop. Was that and one we bigger? Were, it was not only bigger, but it was custom. So it was a entirely new device yeah. that was closed loop in the sense that it only served the purpose of cooking our meals. And, and that, was a, that was a big issue, uh, yeah. so that was number one. Number two, it, it was hugely customized, and so there was gonna be a ton of tech development that would have to happen to make that at scale. Yeah. Custom tooling, custom tech development, things like that, that would cost a ton of money and take a ton of time. Yeah. And so we decided, after doing some research, that rather than create this wholly custom device, we should create a countertop appliance that will not only cook our meals, but replace existing appliances in the home. Yeah. And, and we decided on an oven, on a countertop oven, after reading a lot about food science and, and what's happened in commercial kitchens and what high-end chefs use. Yeah. And what we learned is that if you go to a great restaurant and you go to the back of the house, they've got these massive ovens that they call combi ovens. And they're called combi ovens because they combine the use of dry heat, like a traditional oven, and wet heat, which is steam. Yeah. And they do that because it's hugely powerful. You're able to cook a very, very wide variety of meals. You're able to hold food for a long time. You can make deliciously juicy chicken that's also crispy on the outside, all within this one device. Right. The problem is they cost anywhere from $10,000 to $50,000. Right. They're huge, they're unwieldy, and they're hard to use. Yeah. And it's not for a regular consumer. Not it's, at all. Yeah. It's never been successfully brought to the consumer market. So our thought was, let's, let's take that same mm. cooking technology, bring it to the home, but then for the user, 
if they don't ever want to, you know, de- dive into the complexities of using that oven, they don't have to. They can just scan our meals and put them in. Yeah. But it still replaces your toaster yeah. oven. Yeah. Still replaces most of what your microwave does. Yeah. So it could work independently. Like if someone didn't buy your meals, obviously, yeah. um, they work independently and they can make whatever they want in it. Essentially. Right. So on on the oven itself, there are just two buttons. There's a toast button and a reheat button. Mm. And the toast comes out amazing because it steams a little bit and, and keeps the bread moist. So it's better than a standard toaster or toaster oven. And then it reheats beautifully, again, because of the steam. So it doesn't dry out. It doesn't reheat in patches. And then if you want to create your own like elaborate recipes, we've got our own mobile app that allows you to control every single element and do it step by step. So if you wanted top element and fan and steam for two minutes at 300 degrees, you could just input that in your app. So they talk to me about, so that initial three compartment machine, right? So talk about yeah. some of the innovations along the different prototypes and what you added in. Uh, so, so the first prototype after that was uh, another custom device, to be honest. We were trying to create our own oven that also had pressure in it. Yeah. So we bought a pressure cooker and modified it extensively, and it was somewhat disastrous. <laughs> um, Why? Just, what, what happened? It was very hard to maintain oh. temperatures inside and, oh, yeah. and getting it to steam and also use pressure. It, it, it was very janky, and we, we moved from that pretty quickly. Uh, the next step was to find basically the only countertop steam oven on the market. We bought one of those, and we modified it extensively. So it already had the steamer capability. It had a res- water reservoir. It had convection heating, top and bottom heaters. And then we put in all of our own internal electronics, yeah. which would enable it to cook our recipes. So how, paint the picture. Where are you doing this? Is it like some like underground lab in Chicago? <laughs> where, where are you like modifying ovens? Where? So, so for the first three-chamber prototype that we right. did, we hired a small firm here in Chicago I see. that did a lot of the work in China. And that's because I was putting all the money in, so we had to keep costs really low. Yeah. And I knew we just needed some prototype to prove that this was something that could work. Yeah. Um, after we won the New Venture Challenge, uh, I met uh, the person who is now my co-founder, Brian Wilcox. Brian uh, was living in Urbana. He had gotten his PhD at U of I about six years ago in mechanical engineering. Yeah. And immediately after uh, getting his PhD, he started his own product development firm. So the firm is called the Product Manufactory. They had built all kinds of connected devices for small companies, medium-sized mm-hmm. companies, you name it. And they had come highly referred to me. So I went to the firm and said, hey, you know, we just won the New Venture Challenge. I've mm. got this concept. I need help bringing it to life. Um, and I got to know Brian really well. And, and over the course of a few months, as I was interviewing different firms and stuff, I was also actively looking for a co-founder. Yeah. And Brian and I got to know each other really well. And I was pretty transparent with him in saying that, look, a lot of the feedback we're getting from investors and, and folks in the industry is that you know, this is our core technology. Outsourcing it to a firm is not a great decision, yeah. and it's not a good long-term play. Yeah. And, and Brian was actually very open to that, and so we talked about more you know, out-of-the-box compensation structures where they, you know, his firm would take a piece of equity in us and almost become like an in-house CTO. Right. Uh, but ultimately what happened was that Brian came to me and said, look, I, I love what you're doing. I believe in the vision. I want to have the ability to help make it easier for people to eat better, and I think I could do a great job at this what do you think if I come on board as a co-founder and CTO of the company? And, and that was one of the pivotal moments of the business. This happened about a year ago. Yeah. Uh, Brian came on board full time and we ended up being able to leverage the firm that he had built that is still around and, and successful. And there's a, we've got a big machine shop in Urbana and we did a lot of our tech development there yeah. at the time. We still do a lot of it now. So they've got tools and all these things. And that's where we went through these quick iterations on the ovens. Right. So what's some of the best innovations or advice you've gotten from your co-founder so far? On the we, so we come from very different worlds. My background is entirely in, in business and in food business. And Brian has been an engineer since the day he was born. He, you know, he sees a problem in the house and he's got to fix it. Right. And, and, and so we have very different hats. Brian is unique in the sense that you know, he got his PhD and did not go into academia. And he went, he's got the entrepreneur in him and right. he was proactive enough to go take business classes while he was doing his PhD. So he's, he's a unicorn in the sense that he understands business, understands deep technology, and, and can also manage the higher level things. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like I learn something from him every day. 
uh, simply because he understands the way things work in this world, and that's not my skill. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so it's, I feel very fortunate to have someone like that as a partner. Yeah. And you, before we hit record, you were talking about there's a specific reason you chose the STEAM in the, as, a, yeah. as a choice. Yes. Um, and and that's, that's largely because we learned that being able to steam food in combination with dry heat allows you to cook things much faster, for example. So we can cook a raw chicken breast that's you know, pretty thick, six ounces, from raw to fully cooked in 12 minutes. Yeah. Um, and that's only because we have steam. And there's no microwave technology inside the oven. It is just traditional heating methods. Mm -hmm. uh, so speed is one, and then uh, just quality. So chicken is a great example. If you throw a chicken breast in the oven, it's gonna dry out. Yeah. Unless you do a ton of work to it in advance, it's just gonna dry out. In our oven, we steam the oven for a little bit, gets the chicken really juicy, keeps all the moisture inside, and then we finish it with a super high heat broil that crisps the outside really nice. And normally in, the, in a kitchen, you would have to move back and forth from the oven and change all the different temps and do all these different things. With our oven, it's all baked into a barcode. So yeah. you as the, the customer don't have to do anything. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about the team because what I, I watched several videos and you handle questions really well. I don't know if it's because you've been peppered so many times by investors <laughs> or what, but um, you handle questions really well. And one of the, the questions is about the team um, so talk about, I mean, obviously it's you and Brian, um, and who else is on the team? Uh, yeah. cause I think you would, I don't know at this point when I watched you at six full time. We're, staff. we're now seven full time. Seven, okay. Um, seven full time. And then we've got three interns with us for the summer, yeah. uh, and then a whole host of vendors and stuff. Yeah. But the, the seven full time and it, take a step back. What's challenging about what we do is that we're essentially doing three businesses under one hood, it's horrible. which is, yeah, horrible. which is yeah, it's, it's scary. You have food. You have, I mean, what, so you have food. I see yeah. the technology and appliance side. You separate the technology and the appliance. We, with the we three separate. Businesses? I split the technology into hardware and software. Gotcha. It's a gotcha. Business. Yeah, because you have the There's hardware nothing. appliance side and you have the software side and yeah. then you have the food business side. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Each of those are, are standalone businesses. For exactly. A lot of companies. And that's the feedback I've been getting for two years. Like, this business is too complicated, right. there's too many risks. Uh, there are still many risks involved yeah. in this business because we haven't launched yet, but we have gotten a long ways towards checking a lot of the boxes yeah. and, and de-risking what we're yeah. doing. Yeah. So uh, what do you say to people? They're like, I mean, you have to almost agree with that, right? I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well, what I say is, yes, it is a very complex business, but it is the only way to do it. If, if you want to execute and you believe in our vision that the kitchen is going to be connected and there will be a platform where, where food is customized and made to cook in devices, the only way to properly do it is under one hood. So yeah. we need to be able to control the food. We need to be able to control the software and the machine. Otherwise, the system just doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. So who um, would you decide to bring on the team? Obviously, yeah. you need the, the technical person. Brian is the, the engineering behind the appliances, everything like that. Who else did you decide that you needed? So uh, the, the first person we brought on board, his name is Peter. He was finishing up his uh, PhD in nuclear engineering, actually, when we brought him on board. Slacker. We, we, I know. <laughs> tough, <laughs> tough life. Uh, we brought him on board because he, uh, kind of like Brian, was also very into entrepreneurship and had worked on an automated breakfast appliance, uh, which is how we got synced up initially. Yeah. And, and Peter decided to come on board full time for us. He's done, you know, a ton of the work on yeah. the physical device, a lot of yeah. the work on circuit boards and things yeah. like that. Um, and then on, on the other side of the, the engineering equation, we've got two people on the software side. Adam does all of the back-end software work. Basically, when you scan a barcode, everything that happens behind the scenes to make that cook properly right. uh, and, and to know that, you know, that meal hasn't expired and where it was produced and, and all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then Josh is our mobile app developer. So the mobile app is a huge piece of this, particularly for people that want to make their own meals and share that with the rest of the world. Uh, so Josh is doing all the mobile development uh, in iOS and Android. Yeah. And then on the non-tech side, uh, you've got myself. Alex is our marketing guy, so he comes from the, the agency world, have, having done a lot of work in uh, with different large food and bev clients. Mm -hmm. um, and then our chef, Alexander, uh, who's the most recent hire on the team, uh, which was a very difficult role for us to fill. Yeah, I was uh, going to say, how did you decide on, how did you find him and how did you decide on him? So so the challenge with the role is that 
we were looking for someone that understood food, food science. So because, you know, we're not just making one meal in the oven and serving it right out. We're, we're using an oven that incorporates steam for one, and then we're shipping meals across the country that need to stay shelf stable, not shelf stable, but, but um, can't cook along right. the way, for yeah. example. You know, it's got to keep a little bit, yeah. It's got to keep, right? And, and and everything arrives fresh to your door. That's that's key to our value proposition. That you know, there's no preservatives or additives or anything like that. But yeah. a lot has to go into thinking about what kind of meals will work under that system. You know, right. you you can't just ship a random meal across the country and hope that it'll last. Uh, so so number one was food science. Number two um, was cooking food at scale. So. A lot of chefs you meet have great experience in amazing restaurants, and there's a lot of value there, um, and that was something we were looking for. But they don't understand food business. They don't understand that, yes, you can make yeah. 20... If you have 10,000 customers, then you right. need to produce 10,000 of things. It's very... De- and what our chef Alexander likes to say, because he started his career at Alinea and then went to Noma and Copenhagen oh, and, wow. and some of the best restaurants in the world oh, where sure. you're serving 40 dishes a night. Is a very different proposition than you know when he went to work for a company that did work for McDonald's and Starbucks, where you're serving a hundred thousand over the course of a week and being able to source and yeah. think about wide dietary preferences and things like that. Completely different skill set and yeah. mindset. Um, so, in a sense, we were looking for a unicorn that had all three of those boxes checked. Yeah. Um, and uh, we met Alexander actually because he reached out to us. Hmm. He was running his own business doing uh, food innovation consulting and recipe development for a variety of companies, including SpaceX and NASA and Goose Island, like pretty cool names. And we got some press in Chicago. He was based here and he said, hey, if you're ever looking for some consulting help on on anything, please let me know. Um, And that was in January. So we started the conversation uh, about six months ago. And over time, it became apparent to us that we needed someone full time. And he had gotten intrigued by what we were doing. And uh, you know, long story short, we brought him on board full time. Yeah. So the best strategy is reach out to the best consultants in the, in the world and convince <laughs> them to join your startup. You could say so, that. I'm, so how yeah. do you convince? I mean, really, that's not an easy thing to do. How do you, you're talking to Peter, who's a nuclear engineer, finishes his PhD. How do you convince someone like that to stop what they're doing? And same thing with Brian, right? He's got other clients. He's got a business yeah. and to come on board. What's that conversation look like with the chef? Well, he reached out to you, but with Brian and Peter, they probably were just doing their own thing until you kind of stumbled across their their path. Yeah, I mean, even even with Alexander, it was a difficult convincing because his his business was doing great. His yeah. business on his own was thriving and it was growing and he was making good money. Yeah. And and Josh, our mobile app developer, as well, he was actually running his own business, uh, you know, doing right. a ton of work, and he had a team under him. Yeah. Uh, and it's so what do you put in the Kool-Aid? Like, tell me, what, what do you say to convince <laughs> it's, these guys? It's been a similar story with everyone, I yeah. would say, and yeah. that, you know, we get to know them as people. Uh, yeah. A lot of them are people that we've worked with in the past, um, and, and it's a gradual process. So I think as people spend time with us and understand the bigger vision and, you know, the more talented people we bring on board, the easier the sale becomes. But yeah. um, with Brian and Peter, both of them didn't jump in head first and throw everything to the side. It was, okay, great. This, this sounds promising. I'm going to take it on. And if it doesn't work, I've got an awesome backup plan, right? Like yeah. Brian's firm was still in operation. It still is. Peter was going to finish his PhD in nuclear engineering, could get a great job. Um, Alexander and yeah. Josh both came on board somewhat in a freelance part-time capacity right. to test things out for both sides. And right. that's what we do with anyone we hire. We're like, right. hey, you know, you've gone through our, our interview process. We like you. Now come and work with us. Stay in our office for two, three weeks. Yeah. And over test, that, the, test the side, waters. Test the waters for both sides. Like maybe it's not a fit for them or it's not a fit for us and it can come out. Uh, and, and we've lost a lot of people that way where they come in for two weeks and it's clearly not right. Yeah. Um, but with everyone on the team, it's, it's worked out beautifully. Yeah. So, Dave, obviously, you know, going through this, the investors and everything, you get a lot of objections. Right. So what are some of the big objections? Obviously, one is this is three businesses. You're crazy. This is too complicated. Yeah. What's what are some other big objections you get from people? That is probably the biggest one. Um, it's it's hard to argue with the value proposition of, hey, we're going to put this oven in homes and it's going to deliver a fresh cooked meal at the touch of a button 
everything from breakfast to dessert to snacks. Uh, and, and people, that resonates with everyone from college students to senior citizens to urban professionals because it's a, it's a common pain point where it's like, I don't have time. I want something that's delicious and healthy and I don't want to have to work for it. Um, so that resonates with most investors we talk to. But yes, number one is complexity. Number two, I would say, is there's a lot of reticence in investing in hardware and in food. So hardware yeah, is up and coming. Perfect combination with that. Right. Yeah. Uh, hardware is definitely up and coming. You see more and more companies that are, yeah. you know, smart technology. Yeah. Is that um, because of maintenance and repairs and things like that? Is that why they're cautious about that? No, I think for investors, um, it's much easier to specialize and to understand your industry and your niche really well and know all the players in that space. Um, and, and hardware for a lot of people is this scary black box. Software is great. You write a bunch of code. It scales beautifully. If you get product market fit, we understand. Hardware is huge cogs and in inventory and China and long mm. cycles. It's, it's a lot of things that people are not comfortable with if they've never played in that world. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's still the same business, right? Like we still have to build something that people want and sell it. And we still have to market to them and acquire customers. And fundamentally, it's not that different. But investors are very black and white. And so there's a ton of investors out there that just won't touch hardware. Um, and, and I understand. It's like, great. You know, they know what they do and, and they stick to that. And that makes their jobs easier. Yeah. So that's number one. Uh, food is another piece. There's a lot of investors that are not interested in touching food for a variety of reasons, and particularly over the last year or so, um, you know, there's been some some big, you know, negative negativity around the food industry with certain sectors, um, and that scared some investors. And then the other side of the coin is investors have already made their bets. Some of the bigger investors in the valley have placed their bets in the food industry, and even though what we're doing is novel, there's no one doing what we are doing. Everyone in the food industry is still fighting for the same pie, yeah. whether whether you get your dinner yeah. at McDonald's or Chipotle or Whole Foods or Tovala, it's still the same pie yeah. of, of yeah. budget that's going towards food. Yeah. So you're saying if there's an investor, they've already invested in like Grubhub or something like that, and they're like, I already have my food sector, they're not as much interested in Tovala because of that. Typically. Yeah, yeah. Grubhub, ironically, is is the opposite case. We our lead investors were actually Grubhub's early lead okay. investors. Um, but but a bunch of the newer companies, whether it's a Blue Apron or a Sprig or you know June Oven, for example, is the other smart oven out there. There are there are a lot of investors that had placed their bets already mm -hmm. um, when we're raising our round. So um, that was definitely you know a hurdle that we had to fight through. Yeah. What's been one of the hardest questions you've gotten? from investors? One of the hardest questions. Yeah. Um, early on, I, you know, I, I didn't really know what our brand and our, our brand was going to stand for, yeah. um, particularly on when it came to design, design of the oven and design of the meals. That's yeah. not the world I come from. And I remember being in this meeting in New York with an investor who said, what brand do you admire most from a design standpoint? And it's just not something I had ever really thought about. It's right. not the world I come from. I have now, you know, that was almost a year ago, but that caught me completely off guard. Uh, and I, I did not have a good answer. That guy, that guy ultimately did not give us. A <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there are big challenges there. What have, what have you found so far with the um, appliance side of things? What's been a big challenge you've had to kind of push through with the technology appliance side? In terms of the tech development or from like yeah. the customer side? Yeah, no, not the customer, but actually the development of the actual appliance. Because like you said, you know, there's China and then there's inventory and there's developing right. it, tooling, whatever it is. What's been one of the biggest challenges from that side of things so far? There haven't been any tech hurdles that we've hit and we're like, we can't figure that out. It just, that hasn't happened. What has happened is we are on a very tight timeline and we're, we're shipping units at the end of the year. Yeah, so, and so what, the, we've launch, had to make, the launch. We've had to make compromises on the oven for things that we would like to be in there, and we're just yeah. not going to have Yeah, like what? Um, That's a decision for any, like software, right? You can, you have, you can only include so much. Absolutely. At, at least, I mean, this this is a big difference with hardware. With hardware, once you're, you're set and your tooling's in place, like that is the product you're going to build. Right. With software, we can always upgrade things, and, sure. and our device is connected, so... A lot of the software on the machine will change from December to February, for example. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, 
what Brian and I have used as kind of our guiding light and is, is how we think about what we're doing and, you know, this being in Y Combinator helped really instill this in us is what everything comes back to what is our core value proposition. And that is the ability to scan a meal, put it in, push a button and out comes something delicious. Anything that doesn't contribute to that is not essential, right? right? Everything else is a nice to have. Right. If we're able to demonstrate that value proposition with our first product, from there we can take all the time we want and we can add all these features and things like that. So we use that light as we're making critical decisions. For example, one of the things that we've decided is not hugely vital for this product is uh, a, a purge system for the steam. So uh, we were thinking about putting something into the oven that you could get rid of all the steam in the middle of a cook cycle to help our chef just get rid of the wet atmosphere and to also limit the amount of steam that comes out when you open the front of the oven. We decided, A, the chef didn't think it would make a big difference at all in the taste of the food, yeah. and B, it would be nice if we could get rid of all the steam before you open the front, but not essential. What about challenges on the food side of things? The food side is, is arguably more challenging than the oven side. Really? Um, yeah, there's, there's challenges... In terms of recipe development, like coming up with great recipes that cook in the oven, that piece is not super difficult. Our, our chef creates great stuff every single day. Um, the challenge is in getting that stuff to scale properly yeah. and finding the partners that will do that production for us, making sure it ships really well, thinking through what customers want from the food side of things. Like, do they want sides that match with their meals how many meals are they going to order do they want meal plans do they not want meal plans yeah. and you know it, you can't cater to everyone yeah. um and and we're basically juggling not just the customer demands but the back-end food logistics the more choices we offer the more complicated things get on our end more likely it is that errors happen the more expensive things get it's a lot of moving pieces yeah. um, and and it's hard to make decisions because there's a lot of unknowns as well yeah. So what are some things you decide not to go with on the food side because it just makes it more complicated? There are certain types of ingredients or meals that you're like, we just can't, it's just not realistic. There, so I wouldn't say there's ingredients that we're not including. Um, we've looked into potentially having our proteins frozen um, before they ship out. Maybe just our fish, for example, which is not something we had thought about initially, but is, is actually really common, like a lot of the fresh fresh protein you get in the supermarket, sushi, for example, all of it has been frozen at some point right. and then thawed out. Um, so that's something we've looked into, uh, you know, including uh, sauces on the side as opposed to marinating and shipping them marinated is another thing we've thought about. It's like if you marinate your chicken in certain sauces, if they're acidic or salty, the chicken will actually cook on the way from the kitchen mm. to you. And that will right. change the whole experience uh, right. versus we include a little sauce packet on the side. As soon as you remove the, the lid on the chicken, you put the sauce on and put it in. We don't have that issue, but it adds one more step for the customer. Exactly. Uh, so th those are things that we struggle with on a daily basis. So talk about do you how do you do like focus groups? Do you, do you get a group of people? How do you test the food or idea or the you know, people using the oven? Um, so when we went to Y Combinator, that was Q1 of, of this year, of 2016, yeah. uh, we built 30 prototype ovens, and we, we basically lined up dozens of beta testers. Initially, yeah. it was other companies in YC with us, and then yeah. we moved beyond that, and we would take them the ovens and a bunch of meals, leave them at their house, and then come back after four or five days, interview them, pick them up, yeah. learn whatever we could, and, and iterate on that. Yeah. Uh, so we did that for about two months. Yeah. We served two or three thousand meals, yeah. which was great. Yeah. Um, and and on this go around, you know, as we're gearing up for launch, we have production levels of meals and ovens and app, and it's you know much closer to the real thing. Um, we did a more formal beta program application, and we had you know, a couple thousand people apply for the beta program, and then have called that down right. to to show. I wish I would have found that. Yeah, I would have <laughs> signed up for that. It, it hasn't started yet, so you can oh, still get on the list. Oh, okay. Well, how do uh, I get on the list? I think we'll put our first <laughs> ovens out probably sometime in September. Um, and, and then the way we think about that is every person on the team kind of thinks about what are the key things I want to test. Yeah. Uh, whether, you know, and we try not to make it that many things so that we've got some controls uh, and, then, and then learn from that. 
So what did you learn? What was some of the feedback you got from the couple thousand at the YC with those? And I'm sure those people you, you knew personally, and they probably give really good feedback, very detailed feedback. Yeah. What, what, did they, what did they tell you? The, the most critical things we learned was, one, our, our value proposition resonated with people. They mm -hmm. thought it was magical when they scanned a meal, put it in, and pushed start. And that was with a hacked together, very janky prototype. So we knew we were on to something at that point. Uh, the other stuff was, was fairly low-hanging fruit, uh, stuff that we had planned to do anyway yeah. and just hadn't gotten around yeah. to. But it was important to learn that that was critical. Yeah. So like what, yeah. things like a progress bar on the machine, um, things like sound to indicate that the machine had started, that the machine yeah. was on, and that the meal was done. Right. Um, and, and those were things that people wanted on the machine and on the phone. So they had multiple touch points to know when their meal finished. Uh, those those were like the lower hanging fruit that we realized. Right, you knew that already, was, but we they knew that just confirmed knew that. it. Exactly, exactly. Um, there was interesting feedback on some of the meals that you know we we realized that it's such a new concept to people what we're doing that if we served meals that were also very new, it would not play very well um, because people have no. Um, they have nothing to compare a new meal to. So we served a couple of dishes that were new, like n no basis for comparison. And the feedback on those meals was terrible. Uh, what would and, be considered like a new meal? Like what was in the new meal? It was not so, it was, um, oh God, what, what was it called? It's this uh, traditional, uh, it's a pozole stew. So, so new is not the right word. It's not something that people are familiar with. Yeah. It's a traditional Native American stew. Like that's, if you say like Chilean sea bass, people have heard of that. They've ordered right. that on a menu. Yes. This other thing, there's right. not on any menus. It's a dish that exists, all the ingredients, but not something right. people typically eat. Right. So, I gotcha. so the feedback on it, you know, some people loved it, but a lot of people were like, well, you know, it was, it was really soupy and, you know, I didn't, the chicken didn't taste, the texture wasn't quite right to me, right. even though that they didn't was They didn't know right. what to expect, yeah. Exactly. That's how it should have been versus we went and served something much more traditional like a mac and cheese with a chicken, like a stuffed chicken, super clean chicken breast. Yeah. And the feedback was phenomenal. It's like, oh, this is the best mac and cheese I've ever had. Right. Uh, you know, I've had mac and cheese in a bunch of places. So uh, with a lot of things with our product, there will be a learning curve. Yeah. And so it's a matter of starting people off and then we can start to do some of these crazier yeah. ideas. So David, talk about the decision to go into Y Combinator. That's also a big decision. and it's very hard to get into. Yeah, um, I had actually applied myself um, before. So I had applied in March of 2015 as a solo founder, pre-prototype. Yeah. Same they, idea, but pre-prototype. Yeah, same idea, pre-prototype, solo founder, no partners, no funding, like really early on. And they were still interested. I didn't mm. even get an interview, but they were interested. I got some feedback back and forth from them. Mm. And, they and it was like, okay, the um, they, they had a few questions and they're like, you know, this is intriguing to us. And I, I, I learned through back channels that we're just a little too early and they rarely fund single founders, especially solo founders that are not technical. Yeah. So on the next go around, um, you know, I wasn't sure that I wanted to apply, to be honest. Um, Why? We had really secured commitments for funding. We had our core tech team. Uh, we had a PAP. And, and so I was kind of, you know, I thought I didn't want to do it. Brian had been reading Paul Graham since 2008, uh, uh, right. and, and Paul Graham was really the, the man that turned him into or, or convinced Brian that entrepreneurship was the path for him. Yeah. And so I think Brian was, was pretty biased towards He was going to go. home, yeah. Right. Um, you know, on a personal level, I'd always wanted to live in the Bay Area, so that was enticing, but both of us had significant others, and, and moving across the country didn't sound that great, per se. Um, but what happened was Brian and I went to the Bay Area in August, I think it was late August, to go meet with some investors, meet with some folks that had gone through YC just for advice. And we met with two people, one that had gone through YC, one that worked at YC. And they both basically said we're crazy. And if we could get into Y Combinator, we should go. It's a no-brainer for any early stage company. It sets you on a path and it's, it's a huge, huge win. Right. And, you know, I thought they were, I realized they're right. Like, we, we did not have a name in Silicon Valley. People didn't know us. We had some connections, but not that many. And I also realized that putting the team together in one, under one roof, having very fixed goals over the course of two and a half months would not be something that we could do in our home environment in right. Illinois. Yeah. Uh, so we decided to apply. And, and, and the, sorry, there was one other piece. I also realized 
you know, a lot of people like to bring up, well, they take, you know, six or seven percent and it's $120,000 in exchange for that. And that's not a great valuation. But uh, if you're going to raise a round of funding, getting money from Y Combinator will probably come right back to you in terms of the bump in valuation you get just yeah. from getting into YC. Yeah. So, so we decided to apply. And how did it go? <laughs> Obviously, you got in, but, but it's, uh, yeah. I heard they pepper you with questions. I mean, what was the process like? Yeah, the, the process was pretty crazy. Uh, we, we took our time on the application. Um, you know, we were, we were pretty, I ran the application by six or seven people that had gone through YC. So we got a lot of eyeballs on it, a lot of feedback. Yeah. And when we got our interview, it was super exciting. And we were still working on the, the oven at that point, And we knew we had to get something ready for the, the interview. Right. So it was a forcing mechanism in a way, which we've had right. a ton of over the last eight or nine months yeah. to kind of get our act together, get something working. And so we got one working oven together. We got an app together. We had one recipe developed for it, one barcode developed. And, and we showed up and, you know, we'd done a ton of interview prep and all that. Right. Showed up and uh, we had a meal ready to go. So one meal was ready, cooked, because we right. knew roughly when our interview was going to start. Right. So we served that to them, and then we cooked a meal in the interview room as well, so yeah. they would know that this was legit and it was on right. the level. Right, you're like, look yeah. deep, and it's already cooked. Right. Like, look, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> right, so so the room was smelling really nice, and, and over that time, they they did start peppering us with questions, yeah. and it, it went down a couple rabbit holes we weren't expecting. Like, and we walked, and they were super nice, super yeah. friendly. It was not hostile. But we walked out, and we're like, we have no idea how that went. Really? We really could had no insight into whether yeah. they liked us or not. What was and the so, rabbit hole that you were the, not expecting? So they immediately, Michael Siebel, who's now become a, a close mentor of ours, uh, was like, well, have you thought about replacing ovens in homes and putting this in place of traditional ovens? And we're like, yeah, we have, but it's not, that is not the, the place to go initially. Like, here are all these reasons. And we wasted like four minutes on that. And I, it was killing me. I was looking at the clock and I'm like, God, we've only got 10, 12 minutes max, and we just spent four minutes on something that has nothing to do with our business. <laughs> um, he, he ultimately came around and realized that it what didn't make sense immediately, but you know they, they get interested and they just start asking things. And I think a lot of it's it a good is, sign, right? Yeah, it's, it's a good sign, and they want to see how you think and how you, how you debate and argue about your business and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so, so we had our interview, it was like 12 o'clock, and they said, well, if, if you get in, you'll get a phone call from us sometime after 6 or 7 p.m., and if you don't get in, you'll get an email, uh, and the email could come at any point. And so the rest of the day was just a wash, and every time my phone would buzz with an email, my heart would sing. <laughs> like, oh, right. God, this, this is the one. Eventually, I just turned off my email notifications. And, and Brian and I went to a bar and we just waited for the phone call. And then, and then it finally came and it was amazing. Wow. So what do they say? Just you're in, they hang up or what, what do they tell you? Yeah, yeah I, th I think it was Michael and he called and he said, Hey, this is Michael Siebel from Y Combinator. I want to let you know that, you know, if you guys accept, we, we'd love to have you as part of the winter batch. Um, and, and that's it. Yeah. So what was the most valuable, some of the most valuable advice while you're in the program? Cause then you're in there intense. It's a couple months, right? Right. And you right. move everyone in. What was some of the the critical advice you got from the process? Uh, I think you know specific to our business, making sure that our food tasted good and just getting that hammered into our head as like the critical piece of the business, which is which seems very obvious, but our business is so complicated that it's easy to get lost in. Right. We should go hire ten engineers and make sure the oven is great and the the software works properly and right. not even think about the food. Um, and that has doomed a lot of food tech companies is, ironically enough, ignoring the food piece and not putting enough emphasis on the food piece. Um, that was one piece. I think the other thing that YC hammers home is is launch, launch early and get feedback. And, and we've taken that to heart, you know, back then and even now, like we want to get to market as soon as possible because we understand our value proposition. Yeah. Um, so So those were two of the key lessons, I would say. And then do you go through a demo day? To, is that how you raise the investment to date? We, we do go through a demo day. No, so, so the investment we raised was from before. We, we haven't announced what happened at the demo day. Oh, or, I see. Yeah, um, but we, you, you go through a demo day at the end. And it's, it's funny, it's a very different process than the New Venture Challenge, um, which a lot of the New Venture Challenge is focused on preparing for your presentation and you know being good in front of a crowd and things like that. 
YC, you don't really think about demo day until the week before. And it's an incredibly short presentation. It's like two and a half minutes. Um, but it is a once in a lifetime experience in that you get up on the stage and you're in front of 700 investors. Every well-known investor in the world is there that day. Yeah. Uh, and it's your opportunity to present your business. So it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, uh, you know, you're you energized yeah. that day. Yeah, it's, it's also scary when you get in front of the crowd, but, um, you know, if it goes well, I think it's a, it's a fantastic day. So when do you, when are you allowed to announce what happened? Uh, we, we're probably going to make the announcement towards the end of this year, to be Got honest. It. Got it. So did you expect the overnight success in Kickstarter that you got? <laughs> um, we, we didn't think we would hit our goal in one day. Um, you know, I, I thought it would take some time. I, we were, we were very confident that we would hit our goal by yeah. the end of the campaign. Really? There was, yeah, there was little doubt in that, you know, because we had run the product by so many people and the reception was so positive. Uh, we knew that there was a market of early adopters out there and we had also done all of the legwork on the media front ourselves. And so I had a good sense for what stories were going to land. Hmm. Um, and some of them were high profile yeah. enough that I realized, yeah. well, the word is going to get out. Yeah. Um, and it's compelling enough that we yeah. think we would sell a good amount of machines. What did you know was going to land, David? Um, we knew the Business Insider article would land, which was one of the bigger pieces we had. Yeah. We had no idea that it would become like a, it was like the number one trending story on Business Insider really? for a couple of days. Yeah, that we had no idea. Um, it was, was funny. That, had, did that coincide with the with the Kickstarter, or how did yes, that? Yes. yes. So, so I actually spent a year of my career in PR out of undergrad. It was a crisis PR firm, but I but I still learned some of the the standards for launches and things like that. And right. the way it worked is. You know, we did this. We did a couple media tours across the country, and we embargoed all of our news for the launch date of the Kickstarter. So the thinking was, have a big day and and let that uh, build on itself. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from the Kickstarter process? So you guys, you guys sold over two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of the ovens, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Kickstarter was interesting. Um, man, I, we learned a lot. <laughs> uh, it's a great platform to reach early adopters um, and you know we've we have great people at Kickstarter that have helped us a ton and a lot of friends that have gone through it so I think we've done a, a really good job of following best practice and being very transparent and communicative with our backers right. um, and it's a it's a very unique community and so I, I think it's a great thing for society I, it, you know and I think the way we approached it is probably the right way. We spent a ton of time building a community, building support, getting feedback, and also making sure that we could build this product at scale. We had a good sense for what it would cost, and we had the money to do it. So yeah. the, the money we raised on Kickstarter goes towards uh, the production of those ovens yeah. rather than funding our business, right. um, which I think is a pitfall of a lot of the campaigns that go on there. So when is it launching? Talk about the launch date and what you need to do before then. Yeah, so the first ovens and meals will ship by the end of the year. Um, we, you know, Kickstarter was, was broken up. Some of the ovens were due to ship in December, some in March of next year. Um, you know, it's possible that we actually beat that timeline for the March ones, which would be really exciting. Yeah. Uh, and, and the food will start shipping at the same time. So the the goal internally is basically you get your oven and, you'll be able to order food at the same time, uh, mm. regardless of where you live in the country. So uh, the, the timelines for manufacturing are, are pretty scary, um, but fortunately we're very <laughs> on top of that. Um, you know, if you, if you think about yeah. it, we're, so, we're shipping our product from China to the U.S. That's a four to five week process right. to just load it uh, on the ocean. And then once yeah. it gets to the U.S., another week or so to get to our customers. So if we want to ship by December, you've got to work yeah. backwards. Uh, and then from there, you got to work really far backwards because a lot of the parts that we want in our machines have two to three month lead times uh, if we want to order them in significant volume. So a lot of the Jeez. stuff that we need to do for manufacturing is already done. We've already ordered a lot of the pieces that we need and, and yeah. all of that. It's just needs, assembling it. Right. It needs to be in place by the beginning of October wow. to start assembly and then shipment. Yeah. And you have previous experience in the food industry, right? Because you worked at uh, like Veggie Grill and, and a yeah. couple others. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I started my career actually doing two things. One was working at this PR firm and then 
The other piece was working for the founder of the Veggie Grill, yeah. um, which is, which at the time was a chain of about five locations in California, yeah. uh, all vegan, fast, casual meals. So hmm. think like carne asada, carrot cake, mac and cheese, but all vegan uh, with, with the goal of being a nationwide chain right. of vegan food for the masses. Yeah. Uh, and it was a very well-funded uh, company and they had built an incredibly strong brand. And so I got this great opportunity to learn directly from the founder of that company oh. for about two years. Um, yeah. And I spent a big chunk of that actually working in the restaurant as well yeah. um, in, in the front of house and you know understanding how that business worked. So it was an amazing opportunity. The business is hugely successful. They now have, I think, 30 locations wow. uh, up and down the West Coast. Yeah. So what were um, some things you learned from the founder working directly side by side with him? He treated everyone equally um and this is a guy who's incredibly successful and well off and uh you know brand new employees and people in the back of the house they all held him in really high esteem and respect yeah. and, and i think it's because he treated them equally uh and and you know you had minimum wage employees that had completely bought into the mission of this company hmm. uh, which was amazing because you know your employees in a restaurant are the ones that sell the mission to the customers and sell the vision yeah. to the customers and, and I was the same way. I had totally sipped the Kool-Aid. Um, and and uh, yeah, it was an amazing lesson. So what was, did you know you were going to stay or did you know eventually you'd move on at that point? No, I, I thought I would stay with them for a while. Um, you know, whether it was running one of their locations and then eventually moving more directly into corporate, you know, it was, it was a great environment. It was a great learning environment. It was something I was very passionate about. Uh, but about two years into my time there, I got an opportunity to run a chain of frozen yogurt stores. So this this yeah. small group had locations in California and Ohio. Uh, they were struggling, and and the ownership group owned a lot of different businesses. This wasn't their only business, mm -hmm. and and they said, look, you know, we're we're really intrigued by the work you've done at Veggie Grill. Uh, you're young. You've got a lot of enthusiasm and energy. What do you think about coming on board and seeing if you can help us kind of turn the ship around? Wow. And um, very different environment in the sense that it was unstructured. You know, the, the, the stores weren't doing that great. It wasn't a product that I was personally passionate about, but it was an opportunity to run a business, right. manage dozens of people, manage a pretty large P&L, work on expansion, work on real estate, touch every piece of a business at 24 uh, without risking any of my own capital. Right. And so I decided to do it. I decided to do it, and it was an amazing learning experience. Um, doing all those different things. And, and we did turn around a lot of the chain. Um, and, and yeah, you know, no regrets about that. Yeah. So David, where did, did you, where did you grow up originally? I grew up in Southern California. Oh, it was California. You know? Okay. And yeah. so growing up, did you want to be an entrepreneur? Did you want to go into business? Yeah. Yeah. I, I always thought I would. What'd you want to be? Yeah. I, I never knew what I wanted to do per se. All I knew was that I wanted to start my own business. It, you know, I think a lot of that comes from you know, your parents and mm. my dad has worked for himself for the vast majority of his life. And it's, it's all he's ever really known. Yeah. Um, and, and he tells me he's a, he's an immigrant and he tells me, look, you know, you are blessed and cursed because yeah. you have so much choice and you can do whatever you want. Mm. Uh, whereas I came to America, where was he really from? Uh, he came from Iran. Both oh, of wow. my parents immigrated from Iran. Um, and, and they had no choice. They had to start their own business. They didn't, you know, they didn't know anyone in corporate. They weren't, able to get those kinds of jobs. Even though my, my father is well-educated, he got his MBA here. Um, but, you know, that, that wasn't really a world that he was familiar with. And, and so just growing up in that environment, I think, made me want to do the same thing. Even if it wasn't in the yeah. same industry, I, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. What did he tell you of the difference between Iran and the U.S., him coming here? I'm <laughs> sure you, you heard that a lot. Yeah, I, I mean, what were, yeah. What did he say? One of the fun, the funnier things is so much of business there is done under the table. Anything you want to get done in Iran, at least at the time, you know, my parents left in the late seventies, but yeah. um, everything was involving bribes. So you got a you got a ticket on the street from a policeman, you bribe the policeman, you didn't get your ticket. You wanted to get product out of Iran, you bribed the immigration officials, and you know, like no matter what you wanted to do, you had to grease the wheels. And that's just how business worked out there. Right, right. You know, what's interesting is if you look at your starting off in college, you would never have guessed. So you majored in history, though. So why history if you knew you were going to go into business? Uh, so 
you know, my, my college story is kind of interesting. I was supposed to go to Tulane in New Orleans, uh, and this was 2005, and it was the year of Hurricane Katrina. And so I had actually moved into my dorm in New Orleans when they said Katrina was coming. And so my family and I, we left. We drove west, basically, and hmm. drove all the way to Houston, caught a flight from Houston back to L.A. The rest is, is kind of history, tragic history. Yeah. But I had to find another school to go to. Um, wow. uh, because Tulane was shut down. And so I chose Jeez. UC Santa Barbara because I had a great friend that, that was there. And it was one of the few schools across the country that said that if you don't want to go back to Tulane, you can stay here. And so I thought, well, let me have the optionality. I don't know what's going to happen in right. New Orleans. So I actually hadn't even applied to Santa Barbara. Um, and my intention going to school was I would be a business major. But I, I got to Santa Barbara. I really liked it. Tulane was not in great shape um, and right. decided to stay. And so... Santa Barbara only has an econ program, uh, and, I, and I was actually an econ major initially, didn't like the program at all. It was not practical. And so I moved. History is something I've always been passionate about, and I thought I'd develop some skills there. I'd become a better writer, better arguer, you know, public speaker, things like that. And, and I think it's actually benefited me hugely. Mm -hmm. And on the side, I took, you know, they had minors and constant, like small concentrations in more business management. So I took some classes there, but you know, was was never a business major, and, and that was one of the, the reasons why I decided to get my MBA. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's two things that point, everything points towards business, except for two things. One, you're majored in history, and two, you taught in a school in China? <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that just so, random? So, not exactly. Oh. Uh, you know, I love to travel. I've, and I've you speak four them. languages, too, right? I do, yeah. What I mean, languages do you speak? Uh, Mandarin's not one of them. I speak English, French, Spanish, and Farsi. Oh. Um, but yeah, so I, I had backpacked a lot in college and you know, wanted to explore the world as much as possible. Mm. And you know, as we were nearing graduation, I had talked to a bunch of alums of my school, and they said, look, the longer you can delay the real world, the better, <laughs> and, uh, which is very prescient advice. Right. And I'd had such a good time studying abroad that I thought, right. well, you know, why don't I go abroad before I get a real job in America? Yeah. Um, but there was another part of me that was ambitious and, uh, you know, I didn't want to just throw away the start of my career. And yeah. at the time, and even still, there was so much happening in China. And you'd look on the front page of the newspaper every other day, there was a story about China booming and everything that's happening out there and all the opportunity. And so I thought, why don't I go out there and see what happens? There might be great opportunity to do something when I'm in China. Uh, so it was that plus this was the height of the recession. So getting a, a really good job out of, an un, out of an undergrad that was not an Ivy League school was, was very challenging. And so I went out to China and we, I did almost start a business out there. I came really close and what ultimately kind of decided uh, that, that China was not for me and I didn't yeah. want to live there. But the business that uh, I wanted to start was a custom suits business. Um, I had suits made for me out there that were amazing. They cost $65. And I thought there'd be a huge market for that yeah. domestically, even just on college campuses for graduating seniors. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's since become a booming industry here. Yeah, a lot yeah several of them. Yeah. Suits. And so my friend who I was out there with, we, we joke, you know, that was the road not traveled. But had we done it, you know, and executed, I think it would have been a very successful business. Yeah. But I would probably still be living in China. Did, you, is, did yeah. you make any contacts that have helped you today out there? Because now you're no. doing a lot of, no. No, I did not, unfortunately. Because I went to a lot of the cities where, you know, we, we've traveled since for this yeah. business. But I was in such a different industry and world that none of that has really translated. Yeah. So what are you personally most excited about with the launch right now? I, I am excited to get food in people's homes. And it, what, when it really hits me is when I feel the pain point. Like when I get home on a Wednesday night and it's 730 and I don't want to make food, and I don't really want to order delivery because it's going to take time, and I don't know what I'm going to get, and you know I'm stuck maybe reheating frozen food or putting eggs together or something, and, I, and I'm just yeah. like, man, I wish I could just get a fresh-cooked meal in my home, have yeah. my home smell nice, and, and I'm like, well, you know, good thing. That's the product we're building, and, and I know we have a lot of yeah. customers that feel the same way, yeah. and so I'm just anxious to get the product in yeah. people's homes and kind of fulfill that promise. How many do you have to ship at this point come so, December? So we've sold about 1,000. Um, 700 roughly are, are set to ship in December, um, and, and like I said, we'll see. You know, We might be ahead of the curve on the remainder as well. Yeah. So, David, I have two last questions, um, but first, where can people find out about it? 
Tovala.com, T-O-V-A-L-A. And what can they do right now? Can they pre-order it or? Yes. And again, yes. people may listen to this and it may, you know, who knows when they're listening to this and they may already be out, right? But right. if assuming it's before, uh, what, December of 2016, then where should they go? What can they do? Yeah, if you go to Tovala.com, you can pre-order now. It's only two eighty nine. Uh, when we go to market, it'll be three twenty nine. So it's yeah. at a nice discount. Yeah. Um, and and it's it's set to ship in March for the pre-orders. But like I said, I think we might be a little ahead of schedule there. And then what about the food ordering? So they the, order the, the they pre-order the the uh, oven Tovala oven. Right. Uh, and then how do they order the meals? The, the meal ordering will happen uh, both on the website and on the mobile app. Yeah. Uh, as, as soon as you get your oven shipped to you, you'll, you'll be able to do that. Um, and so can they, so they basically, that mobile app will, sync, does it sync with the actual oven somehow? It does. It does. Yeah, yeah. The mobile app allows you to control the oven. Um, as, as your meals are cooking in the oven, the app will give you notifications and things like that. You can order your meals through the app. You can also share your meals on the community section where you can go and look at other meals that have been made for the device mm. and get some inspiration for food you want to make yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, amazing. So, yeah, Tovala.com. Um, last question. Since Inspired Insider, David, I always ask, what's been the lowest moment and how you push through? And again, like you choose doing a business that has three different businesses combined. <laughs> and then on the flip side, what's been the proudest moment? Start with what's been the lowest and how you push through. Uh, I think the the lowest moment, it wasn't one specific moment, but it was at some point. You know, like it's summer. everything. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was at some point in the summer of 2015 after we'd won the New Venture Challenge and I was going across the country trying to raise money and it was a huge struggle. It yeah. was really, really difficult and um, you know, the new venture challenge has kind of risen in prominence in the Midwest because companies like Grubhub and Braintree have won them. And the winner last year, Simple Mills, who's a great friend of mine, she's doing amazing. And, uh, you know, I felt like there was a lot of pressure and I had to live up to expectations having yeah. won this competition. But I'd go across the country and, you know, some of the criticisms we talked about was stuff that I was hearing and nobody was going to give us money. Mm. And I just I didn't know how we were going to get the business built. Um, so, so that was probably the lowest point, uh, you know, at, at this point last year, roughly. Um, Did you have a I, figure in mind, like I need X amount to yeah. for salary and for tooling and whatever? What did you want to raise at that point? The, the challenge was that it was the tech was kind of an unknown because I didn't have someone on my team that really yeah. understood it inside out and could do accurate forecasting. Yeah. So we were going off of the quotes that some of these product development firms had given us. Yeah. The quotes were all somewhere between half a million to a million dollars. Wow. And so we were looking for a million and a half to, to fund that piece and then everything else that had to happen with the business. And uh, who was on the team at that point when you were going across the country? It was just you. Wow. So how do you keep motivated when you're getting no after no? Uh, I think because so many people had helped me get to that point and, you know, we, we had the support of so many people that no wasn't really an option, not yeah. at that point. You know, maybe if it had taken a year and I still hadn't gotten any commitments, then at that point maybe I would have given up. But, you know, it, it didn't cross my mind at any point, you know, months after we won the competition to stop. How long after did you finally get a yes? So we got we got some yeses. I don't you know I don't want to paint like a completely dire picture. We got some yeses, you know, weeks or a month after. But it was surprisingly, even though we got some yeses, continuing to get yeses was not easy. Um, so we kind of hit a point where I was not getting big commitments. I wasn't getting kind of a large lead investor, um, and that was holding everything up. Yeah, yeah. So what's been the proudest moment for you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Either the, the first night of the Kickstarter where, mm. you know, it's oh, yeah. big unveiling to the world, like here's who we are and, you know, the feedback was so positive. Yeah, it's, it's like people think, oh, this just happened. Right. You probably spent six months trying to get Business Insider and you're on TechCrunch and you're on all these different right. medium, you know, mediums. Right. You know, yeah, it, just, it, was, it just doesn't happen. It was, a t I mean, it, arguably it was over a year because I, what I tell everyone is, you know, when I was in business school working on this, I told everyone what I was doing. 
and I took it, took the business through many classes where we used the, the business as our case study. Yeah. And so either directly or indirectly, I felt like a lot of people were somewhat invested in what I was doing because yeah. I was kind of one of the few crazy people from my class to launch their own business. And those are all people, whether they bought or not, that shared and told other people like about it. I what remember he brought this up in yeah, class. Exactly. And, and, yeah, exactly. And I think they feel a measure of pride, too. It's like I was in the class with him. I helped on this project. And now it's a real thing. And like help them get funded. Yeah. And, and, so, and we got a ton of personal messages the first couple of days we launched, which was like, hey, you know, I'm so proud of you. And, and whether it was friends or family. And, and that was for everyone on our team, not just me. So that was one particular moment. And then kind of recently over the last couple of months, as I look around the office and see, you know, what a year ago was me traveling with this giant prototype, just me across the country getting right. nose. Now we've got this awesome office, which yeah. is one third engineering, one third kitchen, one third workspace. And we've got a team of 10, including our interns and things are happening nonstop so fast. Yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing to look around and take a step yeah. back. Yeah. What were you thinking when that first hundred thousand came through just in 24 hours? We were we were just excited. We were really excited, and but you know, we I was I was very conscious to take a take some time to celebrate and have fun. But I also wanted to make sure the momentum continued and that it wasn't just flash in the pan one day and then we sink immediately after. And and we were able to continue the momentum somewhat, especially through the first week. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, David. Obviously, I have to ask anyone who's watching the video. Um, there's, I don't know, it's probably not a secret plan you said, but behind you, talk about a little bit what's on the whiteboard <laughs> behind you, the, the map. This is yeah. how you've mapped out the success of Tovala behind you. But no, 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 what? no. It's, this is uh, just us talking through the food logistics and, and the different partners that have to be involved and who's going to handle what piece of it and where it's going to happen and how that food will get out to different parts of the country. Yeah, yeah. Any last uh, parting words? of advice or lessons from the journey so far, David? Uh, um, you know, I, I guess I like to tell people that I, I hope my story is um, yet another example that if you have a good idea, you believe in it, and people tell you that it's something that they want, that you just got to persevere, and you will continue to get no's. We get no's every day. Um, but, uh, you know, if you keep at it, I think ultimately you'll be successful. Yeah. David, thank you. Everyone should check out Tovala.com. Fantastic. Great. Thank you for having me.